Independent Living Movement Ireland Marking 30 years of independent living with guest speaker Ada Ranska. Uh, to me, the godfather of independent living was Martin Nothing. Okay. Because he was very crafty, creative, uh, organizational genius, a real godfather. And he once called me the Pope of Independent Living, which I didn't really like. Because the Pope at that time was this conservative uh, German Ratzinger, um, whom I didn't like. And I just didn't find this very um, appropriate to call me the Pope. So, so much about this business was going on from what. But let me talk about independent living to this uh, tonight's uh, lecture. And uh, when I say lecture, it's really a compilation of my own thinking. Uh, it's a very personal uh, account, a uh, very personal definition. And uh, as always in these things, we build on other people's knowledge, insights, and the writings. And uh, so I cannot really claim that anything of that, what you're gonna hear is, original my property it's it's our own collective property and uh, there's so many people different people in the movement and all of us have different um, philosophies and, and different definitions so it'll change uh, from person to person so don't uh, take my word as written as hug in, as uh, cut in stone. To me, independent living is a philosophy and a movement of people with disabilities who work for self-determination, equal opportunities, and self-respect. Independent living does not describe an ideal situation an ideal society, that everything is perfect for disabled people. Sometimes you read that independent living means to have, and then comes a whole catalog of things that we don't have. And that would mean that we don't, can't have, we can't have independent living. To me, independent living is a goal. It's uh, a process, uh, a mental attitude. Uh, it does not mean that we want to do everything by ourselves and do not need anybody or that we want to live in isolation. And th that's very important in other cultures. For example, in Asian cultures, independent living is uh, often accused of being uh, against the culture because uh, Asian cultures, if I may generalize it, as opposed to our Western uh, culture, cultures, Asian cultures are more uh, collective, doing things together, thinking in terms of us rather than me, etc. So they, what that sentence was important. It doesn't mean that we want to do everything by ourselves. We want to live in isolation. Independent living means that we demand the same choices and control in our everyday lives that our non-disabled brothers and sisters, neighbors and friends take for granted. We want to grow up in our families, go to the neighborhood schools, use the same bus as our neighbors, work in jobs that are in line with ours education and interests, and we want to start families of our own. And since we are the best experts on our needs, 
we need to show the solutions we want. We need to be in charge of our lives, think and speak for ourselves, just as everybody else. And to this end, we must support and learn from each other, organize ourselves, and work for political changes that lead to the legal protection and implementation of our human and civil rights. As long as we regard our disabilities as tragedies, we will be pitted. As long as we feel ashamed of who we are, our lives will be regarded as useless. As long as we remain silent, Others will tell us what to do. So there's a lot of demands on ourselves in this philosophy. Talk about independence. Does it make sense to talk about independence in the context of disability? Is not disability in most people's minds synonymous with dependence, dependence on one's family, on the medical professions, on other people's kindness, on the taxpayer's belief that the money is spent for a good cause. Are most people convinced that disabled persons on account of their disability will always depend on other people, need to be protected, and taken care of, since we apparently cannot take care of ourselves. But if the impairment in itself makes us helpless and dependent, how do you explain this? Let me give you a personal example from my biography. In 1961, when I contracted polio and became disabled, that was in Germany. There were no personal assistance services around or accessible apartments. Therefore, I had to spend five years in a hospital. Today, with exactly the same disability, I live in Stockholm in a barrier-free home and have paid personal assistance to help me with my daily needs and accompany me on the my travels. I live with my wife, who does not work as a regular assistant for me. She does that only in emergencies. Our daughter has moved out a long time ago. My impairment has not changed since the 1960s. Society has changed. And I'll give you another example. Some years ago, I had work to do in Jerusalem and Ramallah, the Palestinian occupied area. And there I met three men of about the same age, between 35 and 40, with his exact spinal cord injury. There was a C5-6 lesion. And the three persons, the same medical condition, same age, males, all of them, had completely different lives. Uh, Yuval, he was Israeli citizen, a former helicopter pilot in the Israeli armed forces, uh, with a service-connected injury, had a good pension room, had personal assistance payments, had a converted uh, American uh, van with which he drove me around, had a good office. He was, he started and was the head of Access Israel, an NGO, um, promoting accessible tourism and accessibility in general in the country. He was in good shape. He was widely traveled. Uh, you could tell that he was used 
to uh, convey his ideas, a very well spoken uh, a person that felt secure. And on the other hand, we had uh, Ahmed um, Mah Mahmoud, I think was his name, Mahmoud. He was living in East Jerusalem. Uh, he was originally from uh, Palestine. Um, uh, East Jerusalem had been occupied uh, later and uh, has a semi-standing uh, between, between the other occupied areas and uh, Israel itself. He lived with his wife and his seven children, had uh, uh, the benefits of uh, the Israeli social uh, security system because his wife was an Israeli citizen and he benefited from that. He himself was not an Israeli citizen. When asked about the uh, two-state solution, he was not very fond of it because he said they would immediately sent me back to Palestine. And the third person I met, with exactly the same injury, and exactly the same age, etc., was uh, Mohammed, who was a lawyer living in a tiny village above uh, in, uh, Jerusalem, with a very beautiful view of the city. And that view meant also that uh, it was a very interesting, uh, important location for the Israeli armed forces because from that position up high on the hills overlooking the whole city, you could easily bomb the city. Therefore, no construction was allowed. The roads of that tiny village were in terrible shape. The school was a bombed out building with windows without window panes. And so high up, it does get cold even there in Jerusalem. Um, he, Mohammed, uh, was living uh, with his brother's family. Uh, when I visited him, uh, he had no room for himself. He was staying, living in the former living room lying in bed with a pressure sore, which he apparently couldn't get rid of. Uh, I asked, I saw a manual chair, yet no proper cushion there, which could be one of the explanations for his pressure sores. He had no assistive devices, no medical attention. Um, the country is awfully poor. Uh, the personal assistance was provided by the sons of his brother. As a lawyer, he started the organization Lawyers Without Borders in Ramallah. But to get to Ramallah would take by car 15 minutes, but sometimes due to the roadblocks, it would take two hours or more. And once there was an accident in the little village of a small boy, fell down a tree, hurt himself badly. They called the ambulance. The ambulance couldn't get through all the roadblocks in less than three hours, and when they came, the boy was dead. So, three guys, same age, same Spanish, two of them, the Israeli and the uh, East Jerusalem Palestinian, had the benefits of the social security system. They had adapted bands. Their families were taken care of, uh, but not the third guy who didn't even have medical attention. So, with these examples, I want to suggest that differences in the attitude, you know, and material conditions determine our life opportunities, how dependent or independent we can become. By the way, I'm not claiming here that anyone, disabled or non-disabled, can be completely independent. As human beings, we all are interdependent on each other. Actually, the word independent living, I 
see as a misnomer, it would have been much better to call it life with self-determination, living with self-determination. But my point here is that persons with the exact same disabilities can have completely different lives depending on where they live. In some countries, there are policies and attitudes that allow us to develop and follow our interests. In education and work, meet friends, marry and have children. In other countries, we may be confined to living in institutions with little contact with the outside world, with no or only simple, simple work. So we have to ask ourselves, is disability a medical issue or a question of political priorities? Is it the medical condition that makes you disabled? Or is it the politics of your country? Most disabled people are not helpless or dependent because of their disabilities. They are made dependent and helpless by their country's political priorities and culture of dependency. The culture of dependency is characterized by medicalization of deviations from the norm. Our society declares people who deviate from a narrowly defined norm as being sick. If you are a patient, you are to rest, stay at home, and follow your doctor's orders. And people have to be considered to you. You're not expected to work or take on any responsibilities. In the medical model of disability, the problem and its solutions lie within the individual, not with society. The traditional disability movement is divided into diagnostic groups and in this way confirms the medical model. For this reason, many traditional disability organizations often competing with each other for resources for cures and treatment have been ineffective in working for social change. The culture of dependency is characterized by professionalization. Since disabled people are seen as sick, we are assumed to need to be taken care of by doctors, nurses, physiotherapists, occupational therapists. By the way, my wife is an occupational therapist. By psychologists, a rehabilitation counselors, social workers, etc., etc. Their job is to treat and to train, protect and guide us through life. Due to their former training, they often believe they know our needs better than we do. The more we, people with disabilities, believe in the authority of the helping professions, the less we will do for ourselves. The culture of dependency is characterized by a lack of self-representation. Until a few decades ago, disability organizations commonly used to be run and controlled by person, persons who had no disabilities themselves. Because disabled people were not considered capable of representing themselves. We were invisible in the media, except maybe in the role of helpless, miserable victims. What did this lack of self-representation do to our public image and to our self-image? 
how credible would be a women's rights organization that is headed by men? The culture of dependency is characterized by internalized brainwashing. Without visible examples of positive and successful persons with a disability, many of us do not see any possibilities for improvement in their situation. We get to hear from childhood on that our lives are not worth anything. Isn't that the meaning of the term invalid? I've often seen expressions of fear, pity, and contempt in people's faces when they look at me, depending on the country I, I must admit. Some have told me they would rather kill themselves than live like me without knowing anything about me just by looking at me, projecting their prejudices on me. Being part of and growing up in our society, we often internalize these attitudes and suffer from low self-esteem and low self-respect. We become our worst enemies. Cultural dependency is characterized by self-fulfilling prophecies. When people around you expect very little of you, it is difficult to acquire and maintain a healthy self-confidence. Most likely, you play it safe. You avoid challenges for fear of failing. Without the experience of success and failures, you will not be able to learn from these experiences and grow as a person. You will not realize your potential. Instead, your example will confirm society's prejudice that disabled people are incompetent and helpless. The culture of dependency is characterized by lack of freedom of choice and self-determination. Most disability policy seems to follow the one-size-fits-all principle. But regardless of our abilities, regardless of our needs or preferences, we are lumped into one group. I have to use services that come in one package, the same for everyone. If it doesn't suit you, too bad. Take it or leave it. An example, in most residential institutions, everybody who needs help has to go to bed before the night shift takes over, which is quite early in the evening. Also, people who need practical assistance have to accept help from female and male workers, often against their expressed will. Another thing, when I choose a restaurant, I don't go by the number of stars in the Guide Michelin, but by the number of steps at the entrance. We have to adapt our needs to solutions that other people have decided for us with extremely limited choices and without control over our everyday life, we give up maybe making plans for tomorrow. We have no future. We go through a life feeling like a leaf being blown around by the wind. The culture of dependency is characterized by discrimination. Throughout history, 
disabled people have been facing structural discrimination, a system of tangible and intangible obstacles and sorting mechanisms mechanisms that deny us equal access to life. Some mechanisms are obvious, such as a largely inaccessible built environment, or some countries' laws denying us, for example, the right to work as teachers or to marry. Other mechanisms are more subtle, for example, the notion that it is better for us to be segregated in special kindergartens, special schools, special housing or residential institutions, sheltered workshops, etc. As a result, statistics in every country show that we, as a group, are marginalized and worse off than the general population in terms of education, employment, income, housing, social contacts, or family life. So, how can we stop complaining? How can we do something about this? The breaking the culture of dependency starts with anti-discrimination legislation. The independent living movement demands the same degree of self-determination, freedom of choice and control over our everyday life, that our non-disabled brothers and sisters, friends and neighbors take for granted. In working towards the culture of dependency, we demand effective anti-discrimination legislation that holds lack of access and lack of reasonable accommodations for people with disability as lawful, as unlawful, and actively prosecutes violators with tangible sanctions. One of the best examples of such legislation is the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990 that has led to far reaching changes in infrastructure, in employment conditions, and in the social status of disabled people in the United States. Breaking the culture of dependency means also taking over control over our own organizations, the self-representation. In our movement, the independent living movement, organizations are run and controlled by people with disabilities. We make sure that our demands and the solutions we propose are, rep are presented by people with disabilities who know what they're talking about from first-hand experience. In this way, we demonstrate to the public, to politicians and other disabled people, that people with disabilities know their own best interests and are the prime motor in the work for change. We can break the culture of dependency by peer support. Our foremost pedagogical tool are peer support sessions, where we share among ourselves information, successes and failures, insights into the mechanisms of prejudice, oppression, and self-oppression, where we train ourselves in taking on more responsibilities for our lives. Breaking the culture of dependency entails demedicalization and deprofessionalization. Our movement is not divided by medical diagnosis. 
Despite our different disabilities, we are united by our common experience of discrimination as disabled people. United by our analysis of the causes leading to our second class citizenship and our approach in bringing about social change. Rather than focusing on the medical aspects of disability, we concentrate on our, our empowerment as citizens. Since we consider ourselves to be the best experts on our needs, we see it as our responsibility to develop, to test and promote solutions to our needs. In this, we need allies, members of other disenfranchised minorities, politicians, and professionals who share our analysis and commitment. But we gotta be careful that our allies stay behind us and are not in front of us and damage our image. We break the culture of interdependency through deinstitutionalization. People who depend on practical help by others for such tasks as getting up in the morning, dressing, eating, or personal hygiene often live with their parents, the families. When the parents are getting old, getting too old, their children have to move to institutions. There, they live as invisible citizens, confined to segregated and restrict, restricted lives far off the main street of society. One of the independent living movement's priorities is to liberate our brothers and sisters from institutions by working for community-based solutions. To phase out the residential institutions, we need barrier-free housing and personal assistance services in the community. In Sweden, we have building norm, the building norms of 1978 for residential construction that prescribes elevators, entrances without steps, bathrooms and kitchens that are large enough for wheelchair users in every unit where this multi-family uh, structure is taller than uh, two floors. As a result of this legislation or this standard, well over 20% of Stockholm's housing stock is barrier free. Now, this is my personal uh, estimate. I haven't seen any statistics and it would be uh, very costly to, to find that out, but this is a reasonable estimate, I'd say. Also, since 1994, people who need everyday they help with getting up in the morning, getting dressed and bathed, etc., receive a monthly sum from the National Social Insurance Fund for the purpose of buying personal assistance services. And I'll describe this in some detail later. As a result of these two reforms, there are no residential institutions left in Sweden, with some exceptions, big exceptions. One exception are the 50,000 persons with multiple disabilities including cognitive disabilities, who live in so-called group homes, where each person has his or her own room. But these group homes are not called institutions, although they are according to the definition given by general comment number five on article 19 of the CRPD. Although these solutions are uh, to be classified as institutions. 
the other exception to this are the older persons who live in different types of homes for older persons. But old age homes and similar um, places are pretty much a cultural uh, tradition and nobody would refer to them as residential institutions, although they they uh, comply with the definitions and 